Hello, everyone. Uh, we wish you a great start of the new year. And please allow me to welcome everyone today to today's seminar session. The se seventh seminar session in the series titled Curriculum Studies in Canada. Uh, my name is Ying Ma. I'm the postdoctoral fellow and coordinator for this seminar series. I feel very honored to facilitate today's session. Each session will be approximately one hour with the speakers allowed around 40 minutes to give their presentations, followed by a short Q&A segment. With the permission of each speaker, we will be recording each session and they will become available on both of our website, curriculumstudiesincanada.ca, as well as our YouTube channel. Today, we are very happy to have Dr. Susan Dian from York University to give us a talk. Dr. Dian will introduce herself first to us and give us a presentation titled From Erasure to Recognition to Education Sovereignty, Indigenous People and Curriculum Impossibilities. Welcome, Dr. Dian. Anna Sheik, thank you for that. Um, and can I share my screen? I think uh, Dr. Pina will make you the co-host. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, there we are. Um, so you'll notice that um, I have changed uh, my title uh, slightly, um, and I've um, now talking uh, titled the talk "Making Place: Indigenous People and Curriculum Impossibilities." And um, my talk today is really um, very much a work in progress, and. Um, yeah, so it's a little bit, well, it is what it is. <laughs> okay, now I just have to figure out why it's not letting me advance my slides. Here we are. So I'm going to start with um, a, um, an introduction. So Ni Alongamati, Quinginaw Alongwa, Ni Dushinzi, Sheshko Holoas Dion, Non Jiai Nahi, Walk Toronto, Ni Dilina Pewe, Potatome, Niha Nish Minito, Anishik. So <clears throat> Greetings, um, it's good to be here and thank you to the organizing committee um, for inviting me to participate um, and to share some of my thinking with you. Uh, <clears throat> I want to um, begin, um, rather than a, a, a land acknowledgement, I'm just gonna do a, a little bit of a uh, Lenape opening. Uh, so I've lit, in, I've, uh, lit my smudge and um, I'll just say a few words of, of thanks in Lenape. Ni gatatum abtinayan nano watakan wa kwema wan ki kasik lawato wa kwai ganam wi al melkayang wama kwak ki shalamokwang wich me shakokwayan wak to kwilawik wichi willi watahim wak willi watalindum wich me walalo kawik anashik. So it's, it's nice to be able to um, do that little bit of um, giving thanks and calling on the ancestors to be with me um, in one of my ancestral languages. And in my words of um, greetings, I um, said, uh, I am from down river. And this is a photo of the Delaware River uh, in our language, it's Lenape Hoking, land of the Lenape. It's um, the Delaware River, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's located um, 
on the uh, close to the eastern seaboard of what is now the United States. So the river um, valley um, all the way to the Atlantic coast, um, including Manhattan, uh, was originally Lenape territory. So although my ancestors were forcibly removed from the territory um, during the mid 1700s, our teachings, ontologies, and epistemologies are rooted in life lived uh, in relationship with the river and the land. So we carry our language, our stories, our ceremonies, and our traditions with us wherever we go. And as Brock Pitawanaquat explains, as urban Anishinaabeg, our ancestral legacy is to reconnect with the landscape and live honorably and sustainably wherever we reside. So I myself grew up in a small city in South uh, Western Ontario where the St. Clair River meets Lake Huron and have spent most of my adult life living here on the shores of Lake Ontario in relationship with this place and the urban indigenous community and diversity of people who now call Takaranto home. So, uh, Recently, I, um, I've been learning my language. It's not something that I ever um, expected to have the opportunity to, to do. Um, but when my mom passed to the spirit world, um, and my brothers and sisters and I decided to, um, to try to learn some of um, what, what one of our ancestral languages. Uh, my mom was born at Moravian Town Reserve uh, 47 in uh, south, located in southwestern Ontario, um, but as I said, this is this is our traditional territory. And um, when I was doing a, a language camp, it's interesting how um, the pandemic has actually created new possibilities for teaching and learning. And last March, one of the language teachers from um, one of the Lenape communities in southwestern Ontario organized online language um, classes. So I've had the opportunity to do to participate in classes once a week since the pandemic began. Um, and during a language camp I, I uh, attended in the fall, I uh, had the opportunity to listen to one of the elders who shared a story um, that actually originates from this land. So I wanted to, um, to share this story with you. Um, the story is about, um, about the water drum. And I think maybe some people um, listening may know about the big drum that um, the men sit around and that's used at a powwow. Um, generally, it's used for other ceremonies as well. Um, and some people might be similar, familiar with the smaller hand drum. Well, the water drum is similar to a hand drum, but as the name suggests, uh, it's, it's cylinder shaped. The, the top has a uh, animal hide and there is a hole at the bottom and a plug so that the cylinder can be filled with water. And what I learned from, uh, from the story was that, uh, about this drum was that the water, uh, the, how much water was in the drum uh, determined how far the sound traveled. So the drummer could control the distance that the sound traveled. And you know, as you can see, we, uh, our territory was very wooded. So being able to have a drum that, this, that you could uh, control the distance that the sound traveled was was important. And so I thought that was um, an interesting story and, and was an opportunity for me um, to learn about this drum. And uh, today uh, I'm speaking to you, I'm not using a water drum, but I'm speaking to you via Zoom uh, so that my voice uh, will travel long distances indeed. So. Uh, I, I found that story was, um, was an important one to share with you today about sound and the sound traveling through distances. So my, um, you know, I've given you a little bit of an introduction of my, um, 
my indigenous ancestry. Uh, I'm also a professor uh, in the Faculty of Education at York University, and I've been working in the field of education for more than 30 years. Uh, my research focuses on indigenizing, decolonizing, uh, and realizing indigenous education uh, with specific attention to urban indigenous education and indigenous pedagogy. So I um, work very closely uh, in close collaboration with the Toronto District School Board and um, the Ontario Ministry of Education on um, research and um, program development. So let's... Okay. So as I said, um, I'm really thinking a lot about uh, and want to talk today about place. And so I'm working with the concept of place both in a material sense, but also as metaphor. Uh, the Webster Dictionary defines place as, quote, any portion of space regarded as measured off or distinct from all other space or appropriated to some definite object or use. When I asked Google, what is the importance of place? I found this description. An understanding of place is fundamental to the concept of livability, including transportation related aspects of livability. People live in places, move within and between places, and depend on the movement of goods to and from places. The individual characteristics of places are vital in determining quality of life. I thought it was important to, um, you know, just to think about what, what I, you know, um, determined to be definitions of place that are uh, rooted in Western thought um, and think about those definitions in relationship to indigenous conceptions of place. Uh, Lakota scholar Vine Deloria Jr. explains that indigenous people hold their lands, places, as having the highest possible meaning. Sacred places are the foundation of all other beliefs and practices because they represent the presence of the sacred in our lives. They properly inform us that A, we are not larger than nature, and B, that we have responsibilities to the rest of the natural world that transcend our own personal desires and wishes. So Deloria further explains that relationship derives from living on the land. Experiencing the land taught us to identify the sacred landscapes for which we are responsible. And it is through living in relationship with land that our responsibilities became clear. So this to me is uh, you know, critical to my thinking about the significance of place, what it teaches us and how living in relationship to place teaches us that we're not more important than all other living beings that share our place. So we have responsibilities to all of creation. And yeah, so it's about relationship and responsibilities. So Deloria um, reminds me to think seriously about how place and relationships matter and that we live in relationship with all of creation and that we are responsible for taking care of each other and paying attention to place. So how, what does this have to do with um, curriculum studies in Canada and um, specifically with my work? Well, 
when I was asked to, um, you know, to think back to how and, you know, where my work began, um, I really, you know, started to think about, about the place that I was in um, as a young um, teacher, um, parent of young children, um, daughter, sister, cousin. Um, and, you know, I thought about about how that place was really um, a place of contradictions. So my work really um, began in this place of contradictions where um, I was living a life as um, an indigenous woman, an indigenous mother, daughter in Canada. Um, and yet the, um, the images and representations of Indigenous people that I was confronted with in my daily life um, created uh, conflict and confusion. So the, um, my work in the field of Indigenous education is really grounded um, in you know, both my, my personal and professional experiences because um, I, I began my professional career as an elementary school teacher. And it was as a teacher that um, these, uh, this confusion um, really, it was a confusion that I had always experienced, but it became, I would say, very um, uh, a point of, of pressing concern. Um, the more time that I spent observing, you know, what, was happening, what took place, and what the representation of Indigenous people in the school curriculum looked like. And, you know, in, in some of my early writing, I talk about the, um, you know, the experiences that I had as a teacher and watching um, te other teachers um, teach about uh, Indigenous people and you know, how every year I would see um, totem poles made out of cardboard boxes, you know, appear in the school foyer and, um, uh, you know, displays of Indian villages um, in the library with uh, toothpick uh, teepees and longhouses made from popsicle sticks and um, sugar cube igloos. Uh, <clears throat> So it was these experiences, and, and actually it was when my own children started to um, experience these units of study in Ontario in the early 1990s, these lessons were taught in the junior grades. So I was a primary school um, teacher. I was teaching grade one and two at the time. And so I was always watching this happen from a distance. But when my own children started um, to enter into the junior grades and experience these lessons. That's, that was a, a you know, a, a, I would say a turning point for me when I realized that um, the questions and the concerns that I had, um, you know, that it was my responsibility. And, you know, I was living in this this confusion in this place of, of contradictions um, and conflicts, um, yet at the same time, I was a teacher and um, education was my place. And I had, I felt um, a profound responsibility um, to respond to um, the contradictions um, and the confusion that I was experiencing. And that's when I, um, started my, um, my academic work and uh, turned to, uh, you know, um, went to graduate school and started to really investigate the, the representation of Indigenous people in um, public school curriculum. And as I said, I was um, doing this work in the, uh, I started grad school in the early 1990s and, um, did a master's and a PhD in um, curriculum studies at OISE UT. So when I came, when I arrived at, um, at OISE, I um, realized that I was, um, you know, not the only one asking questions about 
um, you know, whose knowledge uh, mattered, uh, whose stories were included in the curriculum and whose weren't. And I you know, engaged with uh, cr critical pedagogy and um, really found a place, I would say, um, a, a home um, in critical pedagogy, um, thinking about and asking um, questions, uh, what well, was a way of, of really framing the questions that I was asking. So one of the, you know, one of the first projects that I did um, was to look at um, history textbooks, um, because I had a sense that the representations were based on very uh, stereotypical representations of Indigenous people. And as I looked at the textbooks, I um, came to, to realize that, indeed, um, the representations were extremely uh, limited and um, constrained by this narrative that as my research progressed, I came to, uh, to write about this narrative of the romantic mythical other. And you know, it was quite clear to me that stories about native people were, uh, you know, indigenous people were, were positioned as a people of the past, uh, people who were hunters, fishers, and gatherers who traveled by canoe, carried tomahawks and wore, wore paint, uh, really lessons that positioned um, real Indians as a people um, of the past. So the more um, work, the more research that I did, the more that I worked with teachers, um, I you know, came to realize that um, the place for Indigenous people in the curriculum was, as I said, um, extremely limited. And um, what I felt uh, was, was clear was that there was actually a lack of place for the representation of Indigenous humanity, of um, complexity and diversity uh, within Indigenous people's lives. My initial research also um, <laughs> deepened my awareness of what was um, happening in the curriculum. And more than a lack of place, I came to recognize that there was um, a refusal of refusing to make a place on the part of teachers um, and educators that um, this, this, it wasn't just that there was no place, it was that there was a refusal to make a place for um, the stories of uh, and the lived experiences, the um, perspectives uh, of Indigenous people, our histories, our stories, our um, knowledge uh, was, it was actually actively refused. And you know, as I continued to do research, I, I came to, to recognize the, the grounds on which um, this refusal was framed. Um, you know, teachers would uh, tell me that, um, you know, that they couldn't teach the stories because they, um, they didn't know the stories. Um, they told me that, um, you know, indigenous people, real indigenous people lived a long time ago and um, their experiences weren't relevant in the present. Um, they didn't want to engage with stories of uh, colonialism um, because, well, they were really hard stories to engage with. Um, they, will they were difficult to hear. Um, they were too hard to listen to. Uh, and um, therefore they didn't feel that they, sh that they should um, listen to the stories, let alone teach them. So while um, my focus in this talk is on curriculum studies and the work of teachers, you know, I recognize that what happens in schools 
is a reflection of what is happening in the broader Canadian context. So my work in Indigenous education began in the early 1990s. Um, at that time, the Indigenous response to the Columbus quincentenary stirred some initial reconsideration of the need to include Indigenous content. And certainly the 1990 events at Ganasatake that some people may uh, recognize as the o Oka crisis um, had an impact, you know, as did the 1996 uh, report of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal people. So these, these events in the broader context were as I said, having uh, some impact and stirring some initial awareness of the need to, to create a place for uh, Indigenous content, Indigenous perspectives to integrate our stories into uh, the curriculum. Um, yet, um, in my experience, um, educators like many ca Canadians um, position themselves as um, what I came to call the perfect stranger position, which, um, you know, teachers uh, that I worked with that I interviewed and talked to about uh, integrating Indigenous material would say to me, I can't teach this content. I know nothing about Indigenous people. I have no friends who are Indigenous. I didn't grow up near a reserve. I didn't learn anything when I was in school. I'm a perfect stranger to Indigenous people. And so in my um, book, Braiding Histories, I wrote about the allure and the enticing nature of this position, explaining how it is ultimately an avoidance tactic. If you are a perfect stranger to Indigenous people, you have no responsibility to participate in doing the work required to accomplish justice and equity in the relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. So teachers in Canadian classrooms were relying heavily on the national narrative of Canada, the good justice seeking nation. And so uh, along with that um, narrative, um, and the impact of uh, multicultural and anti-racist discourses, um, you know, allowed the teachers uh, to justify the ongoing exclusion of Indigenous content in K to 12 classrooms. So I would say that um, it wasn't actually um, until the 2015 report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission with its 94 calls to action, um, this report actually, I would say, pushed educators to engage with residential school history. And today, ministries of education are grappling with the questions of what to teach, how to teach, when to teach. So in important ways, this demand is surfacing longstanding challenges, including a population of teachers who know very little about Indigenous people's experiences and perspectives, and who report ongoing fear about integrating Indigenous content in their curriculum. So this um, slide um, you know, really draws attention to um, and I think it's, it, it's important for us as educators to think about and to recognize that it was the work of Indigenous activists, artists, educators, and community members um, across Turtle Island um, whose, you know, active work um, in collaboration were insisting on the right to place. Right? A place in for our stories to be included in the national narrative, um, for our, um, our rights as Indigenous people to be recognized. So it was this work that was happening at, um, in the broader social political context that certainly impacted the, um, the creation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and then the, um, the impact that that um, report, the report of the commission had on um, schools and uh, uh, systems of education. But, you know, at the same time as this, um, you know, was happening, what, um, what, what 
I think was is also really important to think about is the ways in which this demand that a place be created, that the place be made for the inclusion of Indigenous content, it really um, work in the last um, five to seven years has um, demonstrated that um, while Indigenous people are insisting that our stories be told, what you know, educators, Indigenous educators are confronting is this ongoing um, challenge of a population of teachers who uh, don't know what to teach or how to teach the content, um, who continue to um, be report fear and um, about doing it wrong, about not knowing what to do, um, not having the knowledge, not feeling confident in their knowledge of, um, of the history so as to be able to teach it. And the ways in which uh, Indigenous experiences and perspectives challenge the national narrative that uh, many teachers rely on and are heavily invested in um, has a lot to do with the resistance and um, the, the, the inability, um, the incapacity to create a place for um, the integration of Indigenous content. So, um, I want to uh, shift a little bit um, back to my own um, my own history and my own um, research and work, because between the um, the 1996 Royal Commission and um, the beginning of the um, you know, the the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, my work kind of took um, a little bit of a turn. And this was uh, a result of a research project that I did um, in collaboration with educators at the Toronto District School Board. So interestingly enough, it wasn't actually until 2007 that the Ministry uh, of Education in Ontario uh, published uh, uh, their first policy document addressing Indigenous education. So some of these events that I was talking about, the 96 um, Royal Commission uh, report, um, the Royal Commission, uh, you know, that was 1996. And this uh, policy framework, the Ontario First Nations Métis Inuit Education Policy Framework didn't come out until 2007. And, you know, the, the report actually had um, identified three, uh, three goals. Um, and that was uh, to increase Indigenous student achievement, to close the Indigenous student achievement gap, and to increase public confidence in the education system. So when you read this document, it becomes really clear that it was as if in it wasn't until 2007 that the Ministry of Education actually realized that they had Indigenous students in their classrooms and that teachers actually had a responsibility. You know, this, um, you know, harkens back to those um, discourses and, um, that I talked about earlier about there being no place. Um, there was no place because teachers believed that you know, Indigenous students went to school on reserves and that they didn't have any Indigenous students in their classrooms and therefore they didn't have to integrate Indigenous content. So, um, yeah, it wasn't until 2007 and, and reading this document, I'm always a little bit overwhelmed by the sense of, oh, we finally come to realize that, that we are actually there. So um, the, the publication of the document though, um, also brought to the attention to the ministry that 
they really didn't know. They, they identified the need to address the Indigenous student achievement gap, but they knew really very little um, about how to do that. So um, they um, created a, uh, a pilot project called the Urban Indigenous Education um, Pilot Project that um, the aim of the project really um, mirrored the aims of the policy framework. And um, it was, um, as it, the name suggests, it was focused on um, Indigenous students attending schools in um, urban centers. And three boards in Ontario were um, funded to do this research project to um, address, to identify and address uh, how uh, urban school boards could respond to um, the needs of Indigenous students. So I was, because I had, a, you know, I had a, a long time relationship with the, um, the school board, the Toronto District School Board, I was asked um, to do this research. And, you know, was, was um, you know, quite, quite happy to do it. It was a, um, came to be a two year project. And um, we looked at uh, the work of educators, the work of um, the, uh, the district school board created an indigenous education office. So we looked at the, their work. But the findings of this, um, this report uh, really created uh, this turning point for me and my work, because one of the most um, striking findings from this work was I had known for a long time the teacher's resistance to the integration of Indigenous content in the curriculum. What I learned through this project was that how teachers felt about the content um, was mirrored in their how they felt about Indigenous students. And um, this I found um, like quite <laughs> profoundly disturbing that, um, you know, I often talk about, you know, teachers um, treated Indigenous uh, content as if, um, you know, we were, or the, the material was like a can of worms, right? They didn't want to open it because they didn't know what to do with it. And as it turned out, they felt and treated Indigenous students in similar ways. Um, they didn't, students reported um, this experiences of teachers not knowing what to do with them or how to respond to um, who they were and, um, and what their needs were. So, yeah, you know, returning to um, Indigenous conceptions of place, here um, I found myself in um, 2010 um, in this place um, where I had Indigenous uh, students, families, and teachers um, come to me and um, asking for, uh, you know, asking for programs. Um, that would serve their needs. So this surfaces an interesting um, question in Indigenous education, because, uh, you know, as the, you know, my research and the policies address the need for Indigenous experiences and perspectives to be integrated across the curriculum for all students, including Indigenous students attending public schools, and yet the capacity of um, schools and school systems and in-service teachers to respond to those needs um, were, you know, there was a, a glaring gap. So um, as a result of this, this work, I, you know, talked about the, the, well, the ministry wanted to talk about the Indigenous student achievement gap, what I was, it, interested in was the knowledge gap on the part of teachers and how that knowledge gap was impacting students. And, you know, ultimately what I did was uh, shift my attention from um, 
the integration of indigenous material into the public school system and turned to uh, think about the creation of um, indigenous programs for um, indigenous students. And um, here in this slide, I um, you know, want to address a little bit about um, you know, what, that what I experienced as um, you know education out of place. So the the experiences of indigenous uh, teachers and students um, was an experience of education out of place. Um, the uh, stories that teachers told um, about indigenous students, you know were reflected in these discourses that were um, extremely um, individualizing um, of um, the, the issues that Indigenous students were um, you know, bringing. And, and it was as if the students themselves were the problem that needed to be solved. So uh, for example, you know, this deficit thinking that positioned Indigenous um, students as damaged, primitive, in need of healing um, from violence. Um, indigenous students, right? These are, you know, the stories that, that um, teachers would tell. Um, indigenous students learn differently. They need to be on the land. So again, this narrative of um, there's something wrong with the student that um, needs to be fixed. Um, oh, students um, just need to be proud. Um, and we'll make uh, drums and dream catchers and that will solve the problem. Um, and of course, in you know, this uh, indigenous positioning indigenous students as well, indigenous students live in poverty and you know, we'll offer breakfast and lunch programs and that will, that will solve the problem. So you know, these are broad strokes kind of, um, but narratives that you know, were, were um, that surfaced in my um, in my lit, in my research that um, really, like I said, caused me to um, to think about my responsibilities and really what was possible um, in terms of um, shifting the um, the focus uh, and what was shifting what was possible in institutions of formal schooling and what wasn't possible. And what did um, Indigenous students and families need? And what um, you know? What did what do uh, students and families have a right to? So, as I said, this um, really caused me to um, to shift my the focus um, of my teaching and research. And really, uh, as um, you know, my roots in critical pedagogy um, have have continued, and I I work very much with linking um, my practice and my um, and develop theory um, in relationship to my practice. So I'm over the past um, ten years, I've been uh, developing. Uh, courses, cohorts, and programs for Indigenous students. And um, learning as I go about um, what and how um, to do uh, Indigenous education in a way that is responsive to the needs of students and families. And I don't, you know, mean to suggest that I've completely, um, you know, uh, uh, turned away from issues confronting teachers in um, uh, public schools where Indigenous and non-Indigenous students um, attend school together. Um, I continued that work, but I would say that the the main focus of my um, my teaching and research has been on um, creating uh, programs uh, for indigenous uh, for indigenous students. And what I haven't done a lot of research um, on you know th these programs yet. Um, but as I think about um, what I'm doing, and as I turn to the to the literature, I feel a little bit of um, 
a frustration in what I'm finding and have you know, turned to some literature on um, land and place as a way of understanding um, what what these what the programs what the programs look like and what the programs need to look like. So education um, grounded in indigenous thought and practice is what um, you know my my current work is focused on. Um, and here I'm uh, drawing on um, Glenn Coltard, uh, who, who writes, I call this place-based foundation of indigenous decolonial thought and practice grounded normativity, by which I mean the modalities of indigenous land connected practices and longstanding experiential knowledge that informs and structure our ethical engagements with the world and our relationships with human and non-human others over time. So Coulthard's work is, um, is you know, helping me to think about um, indigenous education in, um, I guess, what do I say, uh, you know, in, in some different ways. Um, you know, I'm drawn to, um, you know, his, his reference to the modalities of indigenous land connected practices. The, you know, the thing is that the, the work that I do is with um, families that attend um, school in urban centers. So the, the literature that, you know, addresses, you know, land-based education um, doesn't, isn't useful in my um, developing theories of um, indigenous education. And, um, you know, what, what I'm working on is understanding how the, the lessons that indigenous people learn from living on the land, our experience of living in relationship with land, how can that knowledge, how can those teachings be integrated into um, education programs that are um, specifically designed for indigenous um, students? So um, over the past 10 years, I've um, you know, started the, um, uh, an undergraduate course, um, the picture in the top left um, corner of your screen. Um, these are high school students that attend a class once a week called um, Indigenous People Identity and Education. And, um, and so this is the majority of um, indigenous students and you know some of you may know in urban centers um, students indigenous students often find themselves alone in um, their classrooms or sometimes even alone in their schools and so these students uh, come to um, the urban indigenous education center um, during the second semester of the high school term and they do this combined credit course that um, allows them to have access to indigenous content, to meet indigenous peers, um, to have an indigenous instructor, um, and to, um, to do this work in um, a very um, you know, holistic uh, way. Um, so uh, that, that was you know, one of the first um, courses uh, that I um, developed in this collection of um, options that I have called uh, Wulehem, which is a Lenape word for make good tracks. Um, the um, second uh, program that I developed was the Urban Indigenous Education um, Master's Cohort. And we're just launching the fifth cohort now. Um, it's a part-time program. And going back to my understanding of place and responsibility, uh, what I was experiencing in the city was a demand, um, demand being placed right, on Indigenous uh, people in 
the demand placed on teachers, demand placed on um, uh, folks working in um, ministries, social services, um, ministry of education, health, um, for Indigenous people to have to take on more leadership responsibilities. And yet many of um, the adults uh, were who were working in these organizations in this city had never um, experienced um, or never had the opportunity to develop um, the skills that were being required of them. So I created this uh, part-time master's program that would allow um, Indigenous uh, students to come and develop those skills and have access to post-secondary education. And a number of these students um, entered the master's program without an undergraduate degree, um, but I'm able to write um, on their behalf if they have a CV that shows their work in and learning in relationship with um, the community and elders and knowledge keepers, um, then you know they're they're able to um, access the the post secondary program. And it's you know been incredibly successful. I would say forty six now Indigenous um, students have um, received their master's degree through um, through that cohort. And then um, two years ago, about two years ago, we um, launched the Waban Indigenous Teacher Education Program. So you can um, see a photograph from uh, the first cohort of Indigenous teachers. And um, then, of course, when we moved to the online format in um, the spring, there they all are on their last day um, of class. Um, so the, yeah, the Waban um, program, we had 19 uh, self-identified Indigenous students um, graduate from the program in um, July, and all who want to be uh, working in classrooms are um, are doing so. They all they all got jobs, so that was quite exciting. So I'm you know sharing these stories not to um, just simply um, you know, talk about all the, <laughs> the work that I've accomplished, but to situate um, this next, um, you know, uh, section of my talk, where I am thinking about um, what, what does it mean to, um, to create uh, and deliver um, Indigenous education when the majority of your students are Indigenous and the, um, you know, the place that, um, that I want to create for these students. And how do I, how do I begin um, to theorize what this means to make an Indigenous teaching and learning place? And that's, um, it's here where I feel that, you know, some of the um, the current literature um, within curriculum studies and within Indigenous education, um, you know, is is not is not sufficiently responding to what I am experiencing um, within uh, the Willayham courses, cohorts, and programs. And so, uh, you know, I'm I'm thinking about about this you know, this place making that's happening and uh, identifying some of the critical elements to what makes um, these places indigenous, um, these teaching and learning places specifically indigenous and what are the, um, the, the necessary um, components. So, um, so certainly um, indigenous knowledge um, is um, is critical to um, to this space. Um, it's, you know, for me, you know, everything is is connected, right? I when I was doing the research um, and talking to high school students about um, their experiences in school, um, 
one of the students, one of the high school students said to me, this wasn't actually a part of the Decolonizing Our Schools project. This was a series of talking circles I did with youth um, as part of a project that I did with the Ministry of Education in Ontario called the Listening Stone Project. Um, it was very similar though. They were, um, again, working with educators across the province, um, talking to teachers about integrating Indigenous um, perspectives in the um, K to 12 schools. And I did research for four years um, looking at this, this particular um, collaborative inquiry that the ministry was funding. Um, and I did these talking circles with, with high school students. And I asked, one of the questions I asked is, you know, what, how would you like, um, you know, your education, um, what do you need and what would you like to see happen in your um, in your schooling? And, and the students had a you know fair bit to say. And one student's response really struck me as he said, you know, Miss, we don't really know what we want and what we need because we've never had it. And you know, this this comment made me think about, you know, I went back to my own experiences of, of um, contradictions and conflicts um, as, you know, as a teacher, as a student um, attending, you know, institution of uh, formal schooling. And it's a bit overwhelming because Indigenous people have lived on this land since time immemorial and um, our knowledge is, you know, very much a part of this land and a part of um, these places where we live. Um, and yet, um, to a large extent, our knowledge is, um, is not a part of the educational experiences. So in doing um, indigenous education, you know, integrating and, and making a place um, requires the inclusion of indigenous knowledge and accessing um, those teachings that, um, that we have that are, are rooted in our relationship with the land, but that we bring with us into um, our, you know, our current day-to-day uh, -day lives in, in cities. So certainly um, making place uh, requires um, Indigenous community. And, you know, by that, I mean, I mean, in all of the Waleham uh, courses, courses, cohorts and programs, we have um, a majority of Indigenous students. So um, it's usually between 80 and 100% of the students in the programs are Indigenous. And they're all situated, I mean, for those of you who know um, the GTA, um, you know, York University is um, north of the city. It takes um, an hour by public transit from downtown to get to the university. Um, the, the majority of our families and certainly all of the indigenous services are situated in the downtown core. So, um, part of what I do is I have um, a partnership with the TDS, the Toronto District School Board, and they have an Indigenous Education Centre, and all of these uh, courses, um, cohorts and programs are taught at the Indigenous Education Centre. So at the centre, I mean, the centre is alive um, with um, Indigenous community uh, families, the the um, the Indigenous school, um, Wandering Spirit School, is uh, located in the same building. Um, so families are there, um, kids are in and out. You hear the voices of um, our children, um, our elders and artists um, and knowledge keepers are um, in and out of the building. We have book launches and um, film screenings and art exhibits happening at um, the center and, um, and in different locations around 
um, the downtown core where all of our service um, provider agencies are. So there's a there's a flow um, of the community, you know, in and out of um, the building and the um, the classroom space um, has um, uh, Indigenous community uh, present. Um, and so the, you know, the part of this is um, the the ways in which the telling of stories um, gets shared. So the knowledge um, and the community building um, happens um, through the, the storytelling um, and the engagement um, with the work of and the thinking of Indigenous artists, uh, academics, um, filmmakers. Um, it, it's it's a, a fluid um, approach to um, to teaching and learning that happens, but the uh, inclusion and, and access to in, in, uh, Indigenous community is critical to the making of an Indigenous teaching and learning space. My, my heart just um, overflows a little bit looking at some of these pictures. So, um, yeah, so uh, and other ways of um, addressing um, the, you know, how do you do Indigenous education in um, an urban center? Well, bringing in Indigenous cultural practices and teaching through um, Indigenous cultural practice um, is a way of accessing um, the knowledge and um, building um, building understanding. So I um, wanna share um, a quote uh, from uh, Kajeti um, who writes, there is a shared body of understanding among many indigenous peoples that education is really about helping an individual find his or her face, which means finding out who you are, where you come from and your unique character that education should also help you find your heart, which is that passionate sense of self that motivates you and moves you along in life. In addition, education should help you find a foundation on which you may most completely develop and express both your heart and your face. That foundation is your vocation. The work that you do whether it be as an artist, lawyer, teacher. This then is the intent of Indigenous education. It is finding that special kind of work that most fully allows you to express your true self, your heart and your face. So that's Kajeti 2000. Um, so, you know, the, the more that I think about, you know, um, you know, the place of Indigenous education within you know, curriculum studies. You know, I'm thinking about um, the ways in which uh, our um, scholars write about how, um, you know, our practices, our cultural practices are, um, are about understanding who you are in relationship with your community with your family that knowing yourself is really what needs to um, happen along with the um, the development of knowledge and like what what educators would call you know like hard skills the um, the skills of of you know math and reading and writing and it's, it's not that we don't teach those skills, it's that we recognize that the um, understanding of self um, has to happen and self in relationship um, with community, family and place um, needs to happen simultaneously. And the cultivation of um, understanding of self will support the, the the learning of the skills. So in all of these programs, we integrate um, teaching and learning through 
um, cultural practices through ceremony, um, storytelling, um, uh, you know, occupies a significant place in, um, in these programs. And, um, you know, some people might think that, um, you know, indigenous presence in the physical space, um, you know, would be a, you know, a minor consideration. Um, yet, um, I have found that, um, that it has a big impact actually um, on the, the students, the um, images on the walls, the, um, you know, stories um, of our, um, you know, our, the leaders in our community. When you, when I walk into the building to teach a class and I see, you know, pictures from, you know, the grade twos doing their language lesson or the grade fours, you know, did a, uh, a week on treaties and made wampum belts with their teachers. And I see pictures of them, you know, beading and, and learning to bead. The sense of, um, of connection um, to community and the, um, the recognition of presence uh, has, um, has an impact. The, the recognition of ongoing presence of indigenous people in these places of teaching and learning um, has an, an impact on the work that my graduate students in um, the master's cohort um, are doing because it, it, it gives them a sense of connection to a past and to a future that, um, that they want um, to be a part of making. And so, you know, I'm thinking a lot about, you know, this work that, you know, I've been focusing on um, in Wilhelm and thinking about, well, what does this mean for, um, you know, for the, the, those teaching and learning places that um, exist across the country um, where, um, you know, this isn't possible. What, what, what happens in the Wilhelm um, courses, cohorts and programs isn't possible in every um, teaching and learning environment that um, Indigenous um, people, uh, you know, attend. Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not quite there yet. I'm not quite uh, sure about how to transfer what I'm learning about Indigenous pedagogy from here to there. Um, but I have absolute faith um, that, um, you know, the students that graduated from Waban, um, the students that are um, graduating from the master's cohort um, are taking um, their, their knowledge and understanding, their, um, their learning um, from, from these programs and integrating that into the places um, where they find themselves um, living in relationship and responding to um, their responsibilities as um, educators and leaders. So that's um, kind of the end of um, my talk. Um, you, know, you can see I'm drawing on um, you know scholars in um, you know in working with indigenous literature, um, you know in social political thought, and um, and you know some <laughs> scholars in education. Uh, Von Deloria certainly um, was a, uh, a leader in uh, Indigenous education and philosophy um, to, to develop my understanding of, you know, what and how to do Indigenous education in a way um, that, you know, one of my, my uh, favorite um, scholars, Eber Hampton, uh, wrote in 1990 something, um, you know, the work of Indigenous educators is um, to develop um, an education system worthy of our children and our ancestors. And, you know, that's what, that's what my work is about. Um, 
I'm a Gokumist now, I have three grandchildren, and I want their um, experiences in school uh, to be different than the experiences that my grandparents had in residential school and um, that my mom and my myself and my siblings um, had in schools. And yeah, so that's what my work is about. So, Anna Sheik. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dian, for your intriguing and very empowering talk. And um, uh, so in the interest of time, um, I, I think, um, I don't know whether you have any questions because uh, right now we are like 10 minutes past one hour. <laughs> so, um, so, but I believe that, um, let me see if, uh, any questions? Oh, there is actually actually some questions uh, in the text um, from Bethy, uh, Kathy Bigmore, and um, so so Kathy uh, Bigmore. Uh, I don't know whether you have a question because yes, I see. Yeah. Yes. My question's too long and complicated because I don't understand it well enough, but it basically has to do with plurality. Multiple indigenous heritages, indigenous face-to-face -face with settlers, uh, you know, how, and, and limited time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that is, um, you know, that is definitely a... Um, you know, the diversity of learners uh, and teachers within any um, specific context is, uh, is definitely um, a challenge. But, um, you know, I really um, experience it as a, um, for the most part, um, a strength when, um, you know, students, you know, are discussing you know, particular readings or the ways in which they're able, you know, to speak to each other and co-construct their knowledge and understanding um, and think about, you know, the different teachings. Like, I mean, in Toronto, we have, you know, Cree and Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee, and, you know, we have a real mix of, um, of, of national Indigenous nations represented and certainly lots of, um, folks from um, you know, South, South America as well that bring their, their knowledge. But it's, I'm not, I'm not even sure that I'm actually responding specifically to your question, but there's, I, I experience it as a strength. And especially since, you know, so much of the work that we're doing is recuperating, right? It's, a, it's about recuperating um, our knowledge and understanding and watching, you know, uh, students talk to and with each other. Is it fair to, to, to foreground the spiritual as a way that you're doing that? Was, is that how you would characterize it? Um, I don't know. In the I mean, the spiritual is a part of it, mm -hmm. but it's not, I don't know that I, I wouldn't say like, spiritual practices are included in the programs, um, but they're part of um, the teaching and learning process, um, but it's not, like it's not exclusively, it's integrated, it's holistic, it's a part of what we do. Uh, we recognize that we learn through um, ceremony as well as you know, learning through engaging with a journal article. Um, yeah, learning happens through, uh, you know, th different avenues with, and that's, that's a part of the, um, I think that a part of what we're, what we're coming to understand through this work that we're doing together. I should mention also that there are um, eight Indigenous PhD candidates um, so there's a PhD cohort as well as, and you know, these programs have really developed um, in response to the needs of the community. So as more students got their master's 
degrees, then, you know, they came to me and said, Susan, now we want a PhD program. So I couldn't quite get a program, but <laughs> I got a cohort <laughs> so that, you know, they can learn in relationship with each other. So yeah, it's really about, you know, cult hearts, um, you know, uh, grounded normativity is really about thinking about how and what are those lessons, those teachings that our ancestors knew from their experience of living on the land, how do we access that knowledge and bring it into an indigenous teaching and learning place? And we do that, you know, through, um, we do it through ceremony, but we also do it through story, right? The, um, the, the reading of, of the literature um, that is, you know, our land and our relationship to land is storied. And so we can access that knowledge through, um, through the sharing of um, indigenous authored stories and stories from different nations and looking at, you know, different um, uh, people's creation stories, for example, and how just the sharing of creation stories um, contributes to um, the, um, you know, the, the, the deepening of our knowledge and understanding of what our, um, you know, of those, those lessons from the land. The, oh, I lost my, I lost my train now. <laughs> I didn't know if somebody, um, yeah, heart forward. Yeah. It's, you know, and I'm, I mean, I haven't, I didn't talk a lot about um, like the, what it means to teach about the history of colonialism, um, what it means to teach about, you know, residential school history to a class of, um, you know, 20 Indigenous high school students mm -hmm. who come, you know, on a Wednesday night, you know, but I tell you the, the murmur in the room when they hear the stories of survivors and um, you, know, you, you develop strategies that give students space within this place to talk with each other. And of course you don't teach that on the first day, they've developed relationships with each other. Um, but the yeah, there's that discourse of the poor victimized other, mm. that doesn't happen in these classes, right? It's sad and it's hard, um, but there's this sense of, you know, we have a right to these stories. Ugh. These stories help us make sense of our families. Um, you know, my mother doesn't have a problem with substance abuse because she doesn't love me. My mother has, maybe her substance abuse is about not being able to bear the weight of the stories of her experience in school. So yeah, there's something about the creating those relationships in place that allows um, for, um, you know, the, the trust to happen that allows and that, you know, that that's critical for the learning to happen. So, um, and then these students, you know, write, um, you know, the writing that they do in that class is very different than the writing that they do in their English class, um, right? They're, I mean, I've been teaching this course now for eight years, so um, lots of conversations with um, classroom English teachers who want to know how it is that the student could pass this university course when they can't, you know, they don't have the skills to get through the grade 10 history. So it, 
it's like there's a connection between um you know what you write here about the heart and like a, a holistic approach to um you know to cultivating the whole self of the student um in this space and acknowledging their relationship to place in history and that that creates you know alternative learning experiences and allows a different kind of learning to happen thank you so much um, for the question and i want to thank dr dean again um, for your wonderful speech and i i think uh, con uh, considering the time constraints i need to close today's session and uh, I also hope to thank Dr. William Piner and Dr. Anthelin for hosting this seminar series and those who make this possible. Um, and I want to thank each of you to participate in today's session. Our next seminar session is scheduled on February the 8th, 2021. And we are looking forward to seeing you then. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> and the she